Hello, I'm Tim Sandal, back with you with a new series of videos. And this is looking at the revision to EU GMP Annex 1, which is signaling to us what we need to do now to get ready for the new GMP guidance. But before we do that, it's always useful to look at the past to know where we are in the present. So just before we start, I happen to have here the original Orange Guide issued in 1971 and it's, let's double check, 23 pages. That's the entire EU GMP system. If you looked at EU GMP today and put it all together, it looks something like this. So you can just see how regulations have evolved. And in here, there is an Annex one, but there's Appendix one, which is all about the manufacture of sterile products. And it is three pages long. So you can see the journey we've come on. Anyway, let's go to the um, revision to Annex. Okay, so this first video is very much about setting the scene and looking at the underlying values and principles that inform Annex one. So unfortunately, before we get into the nitty gritty, we've got to just go through some basic concepts. Um, so this first video will just touch upon those underlying values that we just need to be aware of before we start going into the into the detail of a document. OK, so the first thing about Annex 1, it opens up with a scope and it says that the Annex applies to all types of sterile products but any other types of products that are manufactured within controlled environments, there will be elements of interest. And this is everything from incoming raw materials to final packaging to the distribution of the medicinal product. Now, QRM or quality risk management needs to be embedded into everything. And QRM applies to this document in its entirety. And the Annex is very clear that it's only dealing with the minimum requirements. So where things like frequency are mentioned, it's only the minimum. And it says that history has to be taken into account when setting frequencies. And also anything that's deemed to have been impactful in the past, particularly on the safety of patients, must continually be revised and checked. It can't be put on a shelf um, gathered with dust and forgotten about. And the core risks that uh, the QRM extends to are microbial, particulate, and that's visible particles, subvisible particles, and airborne particles, and any pyrogenic substance, that's any substance that can cause a fever. But of course, there are other forms of contamination that also need to be considered. So, after the scope, there are three principles, and we're quickly going to run through what those principles are. So the first principle governs the facility. So it says that facility equipment and design must be optimal for the process. So there's lots of stuff about reliability. It must be qualified and it must be validated. And there's also the statement that each manufacturer must be using quality by design. That means making sure that all the quality elements have been captured in the design stage before the equipment is purchased and put into place. And that the technologies used must be the best available to protect the product from sources of contamination. That could be from the air, from people, from materials, from the surrounding environment, from water, and so on. So this includes the use of full restricted access barrier systems, isolators, robotic systems, automation, the adoption of rapid microbiological methods and real-time monitoring systems. Now, the second principle is about people, because people are fundamental to the manufacture of medicinal products. So it's saying that all people employed in pharmaceutical facilities must have a minimum level of qualifications and these must be adequate for the job in hand. 
They also must have a level of experience, which could be learning the necessary experience before actually undertaking tasks. There must be training in place, and that training needs to be continuous. But also, fitting in with the culture of quality, the culture of compliance, people must have the right attitude. And in particular, they must understand what contamination is, where it comes from, and the risks involved if something was to go wrong. And this extends from anyone, say, in a warehouse, through to everybody in manufacturing, to everyone in quality, to everyone in research, and through packaging and through the distribution process. The third principle is kind of related, and this is about ensuring that there are some people who have the skill sets for designing, qualifying and monitoring. They understand the process. And in particular, there are two things that are called out. One is engineering expertise, and the other one is a basic understanding of microbiology. And what it's saying with those is they're not departmental specific skills, but these skills need to be infused to people in production, people in engineering, people in validation, people in research, people in sterility assurance, people in quality control, and people in quality assurance. Now, quickly back to quality risk management, because this is so fundamental to the annex. So it's this saying that quality risk management must govern everything, facilities, manufacturing, materials, and so on. And it should be proactive. It should focus on risk identification. It should focus on then identifying risks using scientific principles, and then putting in place mitigation factors. And it's quite important that monitoring is only in place to ensure that the design and control features are actually working. Monitoring itself is not a risk mitigation. And this stands out really fundamentally when it comes to the assurance of sterility, because at the end of the day, that's what we're seeking to achieve with the Annex 1 process. So the manufacturer must take all steps and precautions necessary to ensure the sterility of products manufactured in the facility. And sole reliance on things like the test for sterility and environmental monitoring are not sufficient, especially if there's been a control breakdown. And this is where risk assessment kicks in. So the picture on the slide is of somebody reading a plate that in itself is not sterility assurance. Now there's also the need for a contamination control strategy. So this ties everything together. So every facility is required to have a contamination control strategy. That contamination control strategy must not sit on a shelf gathering dust. Um, it needs to be integral to the quality assurance system. So for example, every QP must be fully conversant with the contamination control strategy. And the contamination control strategy is about design, procedures, technical understanding, organisational methods, and the types of monitoring that are in place to ensure that all of these systems are actually in place and working. And a quality risk um, management must be integral to the contamination control strategy, that is the contamination control strategy can't have been written without any um, focus on risk management. The two are intimately bound together. And the final thing of this general introduction is the pharmaceutical quality system. We used to be just called quality system um, a few years ago. It's now got the, the, the extra P in front of it. So for a really robust and functional quality um, system. You need to have a risk management system. You must have personnel with engineering and scientific knowledge. Which we've mentioned those two. But it also uh, indicates that you have to have effective root cause analysis and root cause analysis must take place for every deviation. And then the cappers generated are based on um, root cause analysis. The contamination control strategy we've mentioned, but it needs to be a document that is continuously updated with the latest updates going in it. it needs to include good distribution practice 
uh, that can't be separate from GMP. Um, those tasked with releasing batches need to be aware of all of the contamination issues and quality by design issues, not just what's in front of them in terms of the batch record. So um, things that don't necessarily go into the batch record, that context must be distilled down to QPs and other quality assurance professionals. And all deviations from procedure and all environmental monitoring excursions, the annex is saying, um, must have a product impact assessment. And it also stresses, don't just focus on the batch that that relates to. You need to ensure that other batches wouldn't have been impacted by that deviation or that set of environmental monitoring excursions. Okay, so that's all the general stuff out of the way. Um, next video, we'll be able to focus on the kind of fundamentals and the nitty gritty and so on. But this was an introduction to the key principles and philosophies and everything else governing the revision to Annex 1, setting the scene for future video. So, I'm Tim Sandal. Thank you very much for watching. Have a great day. Goodbye bye. In the second video, we're going to be looking at premises.